Welcome to episode 6 of the Macbeth discussions and in today's episode we take a look at Act 5, Scene 1 and the guilt and madness of Lady Macbeth. When was it she last walked? Since His Majesty went into the field, I've seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. A great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? That, sir, which I will not report after her. You may to me, and tis most meet you should. Neither to you nor anyone, having no witness to confirm my speech. Lo, you hear she comes. This is her very guise, and upon my life, fast asleep. Observe her. Stand close. How came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. She has light by her continually. Tis her command. You see, her eyes are open. Aye, but their sense is shut. What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I've known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. Yet here's a spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out. Damn spot. Out, I say. One. Two. Why then, tis time to do it. Hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie. A soldier and a feared. What need we fear who knows it when none can call our power to account? Yet, who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Do you mark that? The Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands ne'er be clean? No more of that, my lord. No more of that. You mar all with a starting. Go to, go to. You have known what you should not. She has spoke what she should not. I'm sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. Oh, here's a smell of the blood still. Oh, all the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh, oh. What a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. Well, well, well. Pray God it be, sir. This disease is beyond my practice. Yet, I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds. Wash your hands, put on your nightgown. Look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried. He cannot come out on his grave. Even so. To bed. To bed. There's knocking at the gate. Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed. To bed. To bed. Will she go now to bed? Directly. More needs she the divine than the physician. God, God forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her the means of all annoyance, and still keep eyes upon her. So good night. My mind she has mated and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. Hey, thanks everyone for joining the discussion today. We're taking a look at Act 5, Scene 1. Um, and in this scene we see Lady Macbeth uh, really 
coming face to face with her guilt and the consequences of what she and Macbeth have done. And I think this is quite an interesting scene in the way that it connects to Act 2, Scene 2. I think Act 2, do I mean Act 2, Scene 2? I'll just check. Um, Act 3, Scene 2. And that's the scene, is it not, where she um, declares that a little... Um, a little water will wash away this deed. She talks about how um, they can, uh, you know, she says uh, what's done is done, she says in Act 3, uh, Scene 2, whereas in this scene she says uh, what is done cannot be undone. Um, and there's that um, that mirror that, that there's a kind of, op there's an opposite, there's an antithesis between the way in which she underplays the guilt um, in Act 3, Scene 2, and the way in which really I would say it's caught up with her um, by this point in, in Act 5, Scene 1. Um, so I don't know whether anybody had any had any thoughts about that or anything that they'd like to raise about the scene. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you go first, Miss Tracy. Okay. Um, uh, I just love the scene because it is so theatrical. Um, I really like the fact that the dramatic interest shows that Lady Macbeth is being observed by the doctor and the gentlewoman. And that sort of really sets the scene for her undoing. And the fact that she can't keep away from the light, which is the symbol of truth. The hand washing in her sleep, the confessions to what she has done and the genuine horror expressed by the doctor at the end of the scene, to me, just makes this really highly dramatic and very powerful. I think there's something that what you've just said, though, that echoes with it's almost like if you're talking about the the drama of it, um, that, you know, you talked about the, do uh, the doctor and the gentlewoman looking on. Um, it feels quite voyeuristic for me. They represent the audience, I suppose, don't they? Yes. You know, we, we are the outsiders, the audience. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel as though I'm intruding on something that's quite personal. Um, uh, and I find it very difficult not to, and I'm sure Louise will probably correct me, but not to watch this and feel some sympathy for someone who, even though she might have been misguided at best, was uh, was a strong, determined, assertive, confident woman who knew what she wanted and knew how to go after it. Now it is this broken thing on stage, uh, and it, it's a, it's a mess. And I think that's a really sad depiction of of something who was who was quite a strong person. I I agree. I think you know it is a really private scene and. Her, to me, her guilt is obvious here from the way that she sort of enumerates all the things that they've done um, in terms of, um, you know, the killing of Lady Mac Macduff, Banquo's buried. Everything is listed here in some kind of potted summary of all the sins they've committed. And I also think what's really interesting in this scene, I'll go back to Louise's link with, I think it's Act 2, Scene 2, isn't it? When, um, you know, Macbeth talks about sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care and then we have Lady Macbeth who can't sleep but also in that scene he talks about uh, I'm just going down a little bit further you know will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand he's asking it as a question and yet in act five scene one I, I think we just get a full statement of her guilt because she sort of she says here's the smell of blood still all the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. So we get the hyperbole there, but this time she's stating it. He's asking it as a question. She's stating it. It's like this full understanding of her guilt in this scene. Whereas previously she underplayed the possibility of that. He, he always knew that all great Neptunes, you know, w would never wash away the guilt of what they'd done. But she was there saying, oh, a little water clears us off this deed. So I think that brings us back to a conversation we've had previously about um, 
the extent to which either of them really knew what they were getting into. And I think we've said before that perhaps he, through his soliloquy regarding um, the virtues of Duncan, perhaps did have more of an idea of what he was giving up. We've talked about how he says he can't say amen and he, you know, he forgoes a relationship with God and he, he, he leaves God for these worldly desires. I think he, he knew that all along, but I don't think it's until this point that she really understands what he understood back then. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, I, I totally agree with you and it's just absolutely caught up with her now. And in, in this scene, in act five, scene one, we, to me, I, you know, we see her, she's not in control. She's been in control and she's so utterly not in control in this scene. Mm -hmm. It is. And it she is. strays um, from my iambic pentameter, doesn't she, in this part, which is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's and it's such a disjointed scene. Yeah. You know, I quite often get students to read to each punctuation mark, and, and you know, and you really get that feel of a, of a brain that is just so disjointed. I think the one of the things when you're talking about being disjointed there and how out of control she is is. Um, I, I, it, I tracked a little while ago um, the different emotions and tones that she seems to go through. And if you look at, in my opinion, when she's she's frustrated and then surprised and then commanding uh, and back to then taking solace of what I see as taking solace in that line of will not sweeten this little hand. It's almost like now she's finding comfort in that that stereotype of being that fragile, innocent little flower. Um, that for me shows how I think she's lost herself completely. I don't think she knows how she who she is anymore or you know what she's what she's trying to be or do. I it's I think it's just really sad. Um but I I would be interested to know what other people's opinions are of of if they don't feel any sympathy for her at all, why and how they feel that. I think it's a really good depiction of struggling with mental health, which is remarkable for something so old. Um, and in terms of that, I definitely feel sympathy for her because you can't look at what she's going through and not have some understanding of how difficult that is. Um, whether I sympathise with her or whether that balances out with what she's done previously is a different question, I think, for me. Yeah, I think, I think that's... I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that and I think it's you, you can have sympathy with the situation and like you said you can empathize but whether you really can have sympathy for her when the darkness that she called upon herself has now overtaken her um, is is another matter and I think you've got that juxtaposition of her staying close to the light of carrying the candle and not wanting to see the darkness um, mm. that she's created. Whereas when we first met her, this is the last time we see her. The first time we saw her, she was calling the thick night to her and into her. So um, I think it's it's very difficult to have to have sympathy in that regard. But then at the same time, I think I know Miss Reese Cook. You've spoken quite a lot about. Um, you know the role of women at this point and the extent to which it was those um, kind of spirits and the, the calling of the darkness that she had to achieve in order to to, to get that power so I think it's it's um, it's not as clear-cut as as having sympathy for her or not I think um, there's a complexity I don't think there's a complexity to her character, as I've said previously, but I think there's a complexity to the to the situation her character presents us with. Well, she certainly gets what she deserves because of the way that she has behaved. Um, and you can really see that in the way she speaks. Miss Parry has already mentioned her um, by iambic pentameter and the nursery rhyme quality to her garbled speech does relate to a very unstable state of mind and I think the 
I, it's the doctor I really like in this scene and his idea of the foul whisperings and the unnatural deeds and the unnatural troubles and the death pillows, which I think li links rather beautifully with the idea of our essay title on thoughts connecting into deeds, because obviously if she had kept all this to herself and not pushed her husband, who was also having similar thoughts, well, none of this would have happened. So she has brought it all on herself. So, as you say, it, it, is, it is complicated. She deserves some empathy, but she also herself. And it looks like Alfie is in agreement, too. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think there's that. i my back now. I think there's that fact, isn't there, that she realises that she's been instrumental in oh, yes. what's happening to them both. Good word. It's interesting that she says hell is murky, in my opinion, mm. because it's like she she knows the darkness intimately, almost. Mm. Um, whether she's been there before in some way or another, it's kind of we have snippets of that from Macbeth during the play as well. He he's accustomed to these darkened kind of episodes. Mm. We hints towards getting closer to this hell throughout the play, and and as does she at this point. I find that quite interesting. I, I think the whole scene is really powerful because it is so camp, so theatrical. Yes, she's going to get her comeuppance, and she's <laughs> being watched, and it's an invasion of her privacy and everything else. And I mean, to, to see this live would be awesome to get really into the story and to be part of it. And hopefully, we want the students to see it as the high quality drama, which is also massively ahead of its time, and to be able to make connections. And I think the theatrical aspect is so important in this scene. It's almost like here she is. This is the massive crescendo of this woman's crazy behaviour coming up into her face, and she's not even aware of it, which is so ironic because she's so uh, okay. I think I think one of the things that probably uh, this is probably going to make me quite unpopular, um, but I really don't like this scene, and Ooh. I I you know that I'm she's I'm not that keen on her as a character just because I, th I think I think it's quite lazy I think this idea that um she has done this persuading of Macbeth and she's called the evil spirits to her and then she kind of just goes mad and dies in her sleep um or, kill, or, or, or kills herself possibly but it's never explicitly kind of agreed. I, I think it, I think it's a bit lazy on Shakespeare's part. I think it's a bit this kind of disintegration is it's too obvious for me. It, it's too dramatized. It, it's too it's too over the top for me to believe that she's anything other than a foil for Macbeth. I I, I just don't believe in her. I, I, I think a lot of people kind of see her as this great female character of of Shakespeare's, and I just don't I just don't buy into that. And this is one of the scenes that that gives me that opinion. I think you're being too sophisticated in your analysis, though, because if we were to take it back to Shakespeare's time, the Shakespearean audience would have been really shocked at this femme fatale like character, and the mm. Victorians afterwards, and so on. I think maybe you're just putting a little bit too much of a postmodern slant on it mm. there, Macaulay's? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Shakespeare, if he were around today and he could watch some of the dramas that we get to see, if I think about, um, oh, Killing Eve, um, You Must Destroy Me, any of those quality things, I'm sure he would be absolutely enthralled and we wouldn't be calling him lazy in comparison. I don't know. I think that's your po postmodern perspective there. I, th I think there's some mileage in maybe I've just been listening to and thinking about all, all the things you've been saying and, and how I compare my reaction for how I feel about her at the end of the play in comparison to how I feel about him. Um, and I, I I don't know. I think it's it's very easy to treat her as this fragile little thing, you know, that the way that the doctor does and they talk to her. I wonder if whether or not how the doctor and the gentlewoman would have responded and reacted if it had been a man in that position or if it had been Macbeth that was sleepwalking. I think the reactions, their reactions would have been very different. It's certainly, it's very convenient for her to go this way in terms of writing the play because it doesn't have to have 
Macbeth deal with that strong woman at the start when he's on the path that he's on. And yeah, I can understand why you could be critical of that in terms of then her being a well-rounded character because you're not left with her as a force at the end of the play. No, she yeah. the fiend like queen, doesn't she? That's the intention. They have broken the chain of being and they will they will suffer for it. He, the dead butcher, her, the fiend like queen. It's almost like a morality play in that extent. I think there's a point there to be made though about the fact that Macbeth never has to to face her again, never has to deal with that and the convenience of that in terms of this being a play about about him. It's all about him though, isn't it? You get to the end and it's a, <clears throat> I think I feel about, I know we're not on the last scene yet, but I feel about the last scene the way that you feel about this in that it's a little bit contrived and mm. um, you end up with your your two archetypal protagonist, antagonist, whatever you want to say, having the last duel to the death. Um, it would have been it would have been nice if they could have faced up to each other. But then the other the other reality is that you see them your banquet scene, and then you know that they you don't see them again together. Uh, and the fact that she's on stage now, pouring her heart out in a sleep with her guilt sort of oozing out of her because she can't control it shows just how isolated she is i suppose so it's um it, it's it's easy for us retrospectively isn't it to to look back and say well it's just a contrived vehicle for the plot device you know for all this information to come out but um i like tracy's point about thinking about the what the audience would have gone through they would have probably appreciated the simplicity, I think, of the way that the news is reported to you. Yeah, yeah, I think I do get I do get that. Why why does she this is a little bit off off piece, but let's discuss it. Uh why does she not die on stage? Why does she not get why does she not get a death scene? Maybe a dramatic convenience because they're getting it all ready for battle. So they've just got her screaming as if she has just thrown herself off the battlements because they would have had a confined space. They would be getting ready for the next scene. I just think maybe for dramatic impact with the limitations of Elizabethan theatre, mm. that's the way she popped it. That's the way she popped it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in keeping with the rest of the play as well. If you look at the other deaths earlier on, um, I mean, there are a few, but the majority happen off stage. We hear about them on some note or another. Yeah, no. off he pops sort of thing. Off he pops. There we go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know. All the, all the deaths that happen on stage are very male, masculine, orientated, uh -huh. giant battle, you know, aren't they? <laughs> I, I think may, maybe in some way they were trying to protect them from showing this, this person, you know, in dying on stage or, or maybe it just wouldn't have looked very authentic you know, plausible and or I maybe you know it, it's even too. it's even kind of sadder and weaker that she she doesn't even get that final moment and she dies in this kind of really un um you know unemphasized way in this really kind of quite fitting i suppose to her felt... um disintegration I felt that, that, that it's just underlining how far she's gone, that she's not even dignified with presence on the mm. stage at the end. Yeah. What, what Tracy's saying, though, is, I suppose it's, it's quite... I've not thought of it from the viewpoint of it being such a sensory, immersive experience before, you know, the, mm. the, the, the how intense it, it mm. must be, you know, the, the knocking and the, the, the smell of the blood. I, I've... Uh, you know, and the the visual sort of the imagery of her hands, you know, not being able to get rid of it, and the perfume, it's it seems like quite a, I don't know, a exaggerated experience that she's describing. But that fits in with what Tracy was saying of how theatrical and mm. over the top it was. But um, I'd never really thought about the senses before before we started talking about it. Then I think we can agree that this scene shows that. Um, the deeds really have 
return to plague the inventor. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, definitely so. Okay, thank you, um, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you to everybody who took part in the discussion. Some really interesting ideas there. And I hope you'll join us next time for episode seven when we will be discussing Act 5, Scene 5. <laughs>